What should I know about Veritas? You know? It was under the moon. I felt my heart come. I held you in this strange light, a place where shadows run. And as I kissed your glowing skin. So basically, I'm looking to tie the entire world to Veritasium. Bitcoin, it, it's obvious that Bitcoin became or was created as a solution to a significant problem. And the problem was having capital that had no sovereign rights. So when you have money, you put it in the bank and the bank takes your money, pays you close to nothing for it, and then makes a lot with it. And they give you almost none of it in return. It's what I would call um, return of free risk. Uh, to explain to those who are not finance majors or, um, or well-versed in finance from a um, working perspective, there's a concept in finance called the risk-free rate, um, which is a fallacy, by the way. There's no such thing as a risk-free rate. There's always risk. Without risk, you'd have no return. So the only way that takes zero risk is to have zero return. Um, but academically, you have a risk-free rate, which is a rate that governments um, give you, an interest rate that governments give you in order to borrow money from you. So in the U.S., that would be the treasury rate. Okay, let's say the 10-year treasury right now is also very low. I think it's just barely above 1% uh, or 2%. Um, that rate is categorized as being risk-free because the U.S. will not default on it. Um, that is not true. I'm going to give little finance lessons along the way. Um, that is not true because um, the U.S. has technically defaulted once, but it was minor. It was a political skirmish. But the reason why the U.S. won't default on it not because the U.S. is not because the U.S. is so big and powerful economically, which it is, is because the U.S. controls its own currency, okay? And it's a currency that the whole world has to use. It's called the reserve currency, and you need to use it to buy stuff. So when the U.S. comes into a financial burden, right, and they drop interest rates, if they still have a burden, then they print money. So if you borrow $10 from me, okay, um, and uh, I have a problem paying you back that $10 for 10% interest, so I owe you $11 by the end of the year. If times are getting a little hard, what I do is I simply print more US dollars. Okay, so now that $10, um, I print 10 more dollars, so now we have $20 in circulation. So I drop the value of the money in half. So when I pay you 10%, on your $10, okay? You're only really getting 50 cents in interest instead of $1 in interest. So I just saved myself 50% of my debt service. And that $10 that you borrow, when you get it back, is only worth $5. So instead of getting $11 back, you're getting $5.50 back. The US is able to do that at will, okay? And they're doing it right now, by the way, printing large amounts of money with very, very low interest rates. So, um, that in itself debunks the whole concept of risk-free rate, right? There's significant risk. Now, theoretically, the more risk you take, the more compensation you want to get for that risk that you take. So the riskier a bond is, the more money you take in. The riskier a stock is, the more of a return you're supposed to get. The riskier a cryptocurrency is, the more return you want for it. But the problem is banks have taken that out of your power, right? Out of your purview. So now basically you give your money to banks and that's it. So when banks, you take the risk of having your money in a risky bank and they do proprietary trading and risky lending, et cetera, and they give you basis points or 1% in interest, you're getting, instead of a risk-free return, you're getting what I call return-free risk, where you're taking the risk and getting no return from it. So Satoshi, assuming he has a mindset similar to mine, says, you know, since we all have to take some risk, okay, but we all want some control of the return, we're creating self-sovereign money. So Satoshi created a self-sovereign currency, money that is controlled by the users of the money itself and not by an authoritative centralized banking system. And that's the creation of Bitcoin, okay? I was a very big believer of Bitcoin, um, 2013, 2014, much less so now though. And the reason is because the original premise of Bitcoin self-sovereign currency um, that allowed individuals to do business with each other 
moving value, financial value back and forth, okay, through the blockchain without having a lot of third party. That vision has been bastardized, it's been walked, it's been changed by the system itself. Not the Bitcoin system, but the financial system. Most of Bitcoin's um, uh, value right now and utility is not in peer-to-peer -peer transactions and finance, but it's in speculation. Okay, people buy Bitcoin hoping Bitcoin goes up in value versus buying Bitcoin and uh, they become their own self serving bank. And so now you have applications for ETFs, you have over-the-counter funds, which are now very large, 10, 5, 10, 15, 20 billion dollars. Um, I forget how much they are. And basically, Bitcoin has been co-opted by either, either co-opted directly by Wall Street and or co-opted by the Wall Street mentality. Nothing necessarily wrong with that per se, except for the fact that it goes against the ethos of what Bitcoin is itself. Okay, now, Ethereum and other currencies of platforms, blockchain platforms, have come and taken over and Ethereum has much more in the other currencies. I say Ethereum as a blanket for Ethereum and its uh, potential competitors. Uh, they have much more development coming on board. Okay, so now instead of being purely a speculative vehicle, they are also a speculative vehicle, but much more so a utilitarian vehicle that are used to build distributed DeFi and other systems, uh, of which Veritasium, which is a uh, one of my companies is also um, through its hat in the ring, um, tokenizing real world assets and allowing peer to peer transactions for real world assets, again, without an authoritative third party. Now, let it be known that the government doesn't want this to happen, at least the US government. Um, and uh, there have been a lot of bad actors you know, um, in this space, but the government has pretty much went after practically all these small and not all the small capitalized, or all the relatively small and relatively undercapitalized companies and giving them a very, very hard time. Um, and hence, you see a lot of these entrepreneurs um, are either not in the US or have been rolled over by the government. Um, I was just right before this call, I see that the IRS has put out uh, a call, an RFP, for developers who can break the Monero encryption system. Um, and also uh, the liquid, the lightning system as well, which is uh, the overlay for Bitcoin. Um, Monero is a privacy coin. And again, things such as uh, self sovereign finance, uh, private transactions, or things that the US government, and I believe other certain other governments really don't wanna see. The US government has been very heavy handed in this, in my opinion. And I believe they chased a lot of development offshore, okay? Um, but in a nutshell, that's where we've gone from 2008 to, to now. Um, there's been a lot of development, not nearly as much development in the States as it should have been because the U.S. has been anti this. Um, and the reason is, I guess some of the obvious reasons are the, the concern about fraud, money laundering, et cetera, perfectly understandable, okay? But it has been my observation and experience that they've gone way past that. Um, and so they've left the gate open for the big banks to take over and the big institutions, but the small entrepreneur, um, you know, not very competitive in the U.S. is not a good place to do business. So you will see Bitcoin 2.0 and you're seeing it now, um, but it will be ex-U.S. The reason is because this simply is not the place to uh, create a business such as that. And that's in my personal opinion.